welcome to the April 2024 edition of Hunt Camp Mail. I hope everyone had a great Easter and that you're enjoying the spring weather. Even though where I'm at, the spring's been really wet and a little bit cooler than normal, which hasn't been great for the turkey hunting. April is when the fishing really turns up. The turkeys are gobbling. The bears are waking up from hibernation. And the days are getting longer and longer. Luckily, everyone's end of the world fantasy didn't happen during that eclipse that we had. I received a uh, lot of positive responses from my fake experts video that I put out there. And I appreciate all the feedback on that. I also rounded out the month with a, a knife video, a fishing video, and a magazine versus clip video. So you got a lot of variety for the month of April. Well, I received a massive influx of mail for April. So I had to answer most of my letters privately rather than including them on this episode of Hunt Cat Mail. But I picked some of my favorite letters or letters from newer viewers that have never written me before. And uh, I'm going to answer those this month. So let's get to April's mail. And our first letter for the month of April is from Ken in Kansas. Ken wrote, I know you are a fan of the 375 H&H, &H, and I am wanting to purchase a Winchester Model 70 Safari Express chambered in this cartridge. My question is, what is your opinion about the 375 H&H &H versus the Ackley improved version. Is it worth rechambering a rifle to the Ackley? Well, Ken, I don't think it's worth it in my opinion. You know, the old uh, 375 H&H &H is absolutely perfect the way it is for what it was intended for. And if you want more power, you're better off just moving up to a 404 Jeffrey or one of the great 416s out there. You know, if, if you're looking for somebody to justify making things more complicated than they should be, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask. And our next letter is from Gregory from Alberta. Gregory wrote, Why not the Colt Python? I haven't shot any handguns in my life, but your video about the 357 got me interested in this cartridge and revolvers. I've watched dozens of YouTube videos about different revolvers. Based on those, the Smith & Wesson 627 is great, but the Colt Python is absolutely fantastic. But on the other side, Desert Dog most likely has reasons other than round capacity why he chooses the Smith & Wesson 627. Well, I do, Gregory, and it really comes down to how a revolver fits you. You know, in the big picture, fit is a lot more important than capacity. You know, like, uh, like when shooting a shotgun, you just aren't gonna shoot well with a revolver that just doesn't fit your hands well. The Smith & Wesson end frame revolvers fit my hands fantastic, and I tend to shoot those really good. So even though having eight rounds of 357 Magnum in moon clips is absolutely awesome. You know, I, I, I really love that gun just because of the way it fits me, and that's what should matter the most. And our next letter is from Dave in Ontario, Canada. And we're starting today off with, uh, with some Canucks, or what I like to call snow Mexicans. <laughs> but Dave in Canada wrote, Do you have a recommended weight range for a scoped 375 H&H? bolt action for general planes game and dangerous game use in Africa. I suppose there's a range of personal choice based off of felt recoil versus ease of carry, but I'm guessing you've tried a few alternatives in the field and I'd appreciate your thoughts on this. I think this is a question I might have answered before, Dave, but first of all, don't search internet forums for answers to questions like this because 99% of uh, the responses that you're going to get on the internet, um, they're going to give you a rifle weight that they're just guessing and stating it as a fact for you. You know, so a guy out there carrying a CZ 550 and 458 Win Mag will probably tell you, oh, I carry a nine pound rifle. But if you ever put that thing on the scale with a scope on it, it might be 12 pounds, especially with that big old clunky wood stock on it. 
But, uh, you know, a scope 375 with a sling and ammo will weigh well over 9 pounds and might weigh up to 11 pounds depending on the stock. You know, and uh, if you add ammo to the equation in it, that'll probably add, depending on the cartridge you're shooting, close to another half a pound. But a heavy, dangerous game rifle isn't really a bad thing in my mind. You know, the increased weight is what mitigate, mitigates recoil more than probably anything. And let's be honest here. Hunting in Africa isn't sheep hunting in Alaska or, you know, elk hunting in Colorado. A heavier rifle isn't a big deal in Africa. And I think it has more pros than cons to it, to a certain extent. But I honestly don't mind carrying a 10 or 11 pound rifle in Africa. And I think it provides a nice balance for a dangerous game rifle, in my opinion. And our next letter is from Carl from Midland, Texas. Carl wrote, I've been invited on my first turkey hunt in New Mexico, and I've been told that the bears are particularly active and that I should carry a sidearm just in case. I have a Glock in 10 millimeter. Do you have a suggestion on ammo? Examples, Underwood, Buffalo Boar, etc. It's been difficult to determine what is good info versus bullshit. All I seem to find is YouTube videos of people shooting water jugs. My thought was that the capacity of the Glock, which is 15 plus 1, was a positive attribute. But if you have any suggestions for a better sidearm, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, I'll be honest with you here. These, these bear letters kind of crack me up. You know, especially since you're turkey hunting and you'll probably be carrying a 12-gauge shotgun with magnum turkey loads in it. You know, it, it, if you do have a black bear encounter, you're very likely to scare it away by just waving at it or even, you know, the, uh, a last resort would be a warning shot in the air. And I can almost guarantee you that bear's taken off. Um, you know, I, I think you're perfectly fine with your turkey shotgun and no sidearm when hunting in New Mexico. Um, many guides out there in non-grizzly bear areas carry a 40 Smith & Wesson or a 357 Magnum on them. You know, I've had hundreds of black bear encounters in my lifetime. You know, and although I'm usually armed, depending on where I'm at, the uh, fantasy of needing a hand cannon or 15 shots at your disposal is real is just not a reality. It's a fantasy. You know, your your research found guys shooting water jugs and ballistic gel skulls because those are the types of people who obsess over handguns for bears. You know, the real experts who actually interact with bears regularly aren't obsessed with handguns like the keyboard commanders are. You know, I, I know a lot of guys that used to run dogs here in California for bears, and most of them carried a 357 Magnum or a 40 Smith & Wesson on their hip to finish bears off, and they're perfectly happy with those, and they love the... Uh, the lower recoil and accuracy potential of it. So worry about getting your turkey, not about bears. And our next letter is from David in Oklahoma. David wrote, I have a friend that resizes 223 REM cases to 223 AI. He claims he loads a 55 grain bullet to a velocity of 3,900 feet per second and 50 grain to over 4,000 feet per second. I call BS on this, and he gets mad and claims that he is doing it. I actually called Hodgden and asked them if this was even possible, and they said no. Personally, I don't shoot AI cartridges, but I have nothing against them. I just never had the desire to use them. Thank you for your video on the Ackley Improved Cartridges. Well, thank you for the letter, Dave, and I just want to tell you, disclaimer here, this is nothing against you personally, Dave, but your friend is getting the bullshit button. Bullshit! 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 I actually load and shoot the 223 accurate, Ackley Improved, and my highest safe velocities out of a 26-inch barreled 223 AI is just over 3,600 feet per second with 55 grainers and 
H335 powder. 50 grainers ran at the ragged edge of safety go about 3,700 feet per second. So you'll never see over 4,000 feet per second with a bullet over 40 grains when using the 223 AI. That is bullshit. And you called Hodgdon, so you already know this. I keep telling my viewers that you'll never see bullshitters in any hobby like you'll encounter in the firearm industry, and it's true. You know, and this is why I'm so adamant about steering my viewers away from random people that comment on the internet. But uh, I love the 223 Ackley Improved, and in fact, it's one of the few AI cartridges that I really like. But, you know, don't be delusional. You'll only get about 100, uh, maybe 160 feet per second improvement over the standard 223 loads, uh, you know, loaded uh, hot. But uh, that's it. You know, there is no magic turbo button that sends a 55 grain bullet out at 4,000 feet per second, you know, with a uh, 223 AI. That just doesn't happen. And our next letter is from Peter in Anaheim, California. Peter wrote, I've been subscribed to your channel for about a year now, and I think you are the best. I was born in Germany, and most of my family remains there. There appears to be an inside joke with your fans about a naked German hunt. <laughs> I watched some of your older hunt camp mail videos and could not find the origin of that story. What is the naked German hunt? <laughs> That's a legend on Desert Dog Outdoors. I don't know, about four, maybe five years ago, I did a video called uh, USA versus European Hunting Culture where I kind of compared the hunting culture between Americans and Europeans or North Americans and Europeans. In that video though, a very odd German hunter flooded the comment section of that video about how Germans are ethically and even fundamentally better than Americans in just about every way. You know, which of course caused a lot of well-deserved backlash against them. One of the points that this guy made was that American hunters are very wasteful people. He stated that when a group of American men travel to a hunting destination, each guy sleeps in their own separate bed or, you know, they'll, they'll pitch and sleep in their own separate tent. And, you know, he stated that German men are not wasteful and that they have no problem sleeping in the same bed with four other guys and walking around naked together in a hotel room, you know, but uh, when he became the brunt of everybody's jokes in the comment section of that video, he labeled all Americans as homophobes. And, you know, before I muted him from my channel, after he got out of control to a large extent, um, he graced us with this post. And of course, if you watched my deleted comments video, um, I included one of his comments in that and, you know, I gave my commentary on his comment and uh, the naked German hunting party legend was born. And our next letter is from Philip from Missoula, Montana. Philip wrote, your video about long distance hunting showed up on my feed and I watched it with amazement. You put forth your argument and reasoning with uncommon logic and candor. I subscribed and went to your channel to see your content. I'm amazed at the variety of topics you cover, including subjects I've never seen before, like hunting flashlights and hiding your cash on hunting trips. In a world where everyone copies everyone else, you truly forge your own path and I respect that. I'm looking forward to watching your future videos. And welcome to my channel, Philip. And if you watch my channel enough, I do have a lot of connections in Missoula and I'm usually there every year. Um, but to your comment, in this industry, influencers are constantly pressured to review newly released products. So every time there's a new gun or a new binocular or a new bullet released, you're just overwhelmed with the same video done by 50 different influencers. You know, and, and it goes beyond product reviews too. Most hunting influencers 
kind of mirror the same general content that the that their competitors are doing. You know, right now, everybody's on a huge bear defense bandwagon. It's crazy. You know, uh, none of their viewers are ever going to defend themselves from a bear with a handgun, but the uh, the topic seems to give all the keyboard commandos an orgasm. So influencers, you know, people want the content, so they get in on the action. And if you take a look at this uh, little uh, short clip I put together, this is all the recent YouTube activity out there on bears right now. So as you can see, there is kind of a uh, copy culture among YouTube influencers, but I'm going to give Ron Spomer a pass on this one because he brought Phil Shoemaker onto his channel for an interview about bear defense. And what Ron did gave his video a level of credibility that all the other videos just lack. So even though it was parallel content to what other creators are doing right now, what's popular right now, Ron Spomer did that video right. And our next letter is from Johnny from Albany, New York. Johnny wrote, thank you for the video about idiots and trolls. New York is full of educated idiots and what you refer to as fake experts run everything here. I think that video might have ruined my life because every day when I interact with other people, I'm realizing that most people are idiots. Nobody researches anything they believe is the truth anymore, and they constantly repeat it as fact. As you stated, nobody cares to comprehend or even pay attention to details, and this usually concludes with a straw man argument or someone foolishly stating the obvious. That video opened my eyes too much. Now I'd like to return to the matrix. <laughs> Thank you for the great content. And I appreciate that you go beyond just talking about guns and fishing and cover subjects like human behavior and ethics. Well, Johnny, I'm sorry. I'm no longer offering the blue pill. Well, not the one that returns you to the matrix anyway. <laughs> okay, I'll just throw this out there. You are correct, Johnny. Most people are idiots. And this is regardless of political affiliation, religion, race, sex, or educational background. Modern day humans are just biologically inclined to be intellectually lazy <laughs> you, and, and also hyper emotional. And they tend to act on impulses rather than some type of uh, thought process. Scientific studies prove that global IQ scores have been on a troubling decline since the early 2000s. But a low IQ score, in my opinion, doesn't make somebody an idiot or an ignoramus or a fool in any way. You know, our, our intellectual laziness and desire to act on impulse rather than critical thinking 
is actually a learned behavior, in my opinion, and people are kind of being groomed to be like this. Our institutions have been indoctrinating people into intellectual laziness for a long time now, and politicians, university professors, CEOs, religious figures, and globalists want blind obedience, and people who no longer think can be controlled, and that's really the end game here. And our next letter is from Dr. Daryl from Kansas. Dr. Daryl wrote, Desert Dog, I watched your informative video on the need for lapping rings. Forgive me if you covered it and I missed it, but what about the need for lapping vertical rings? I believe all the setups you tested in your video had horizontal rings, and I noticed Warren does not recommend lapping their vertical rings. Do you have any experience or an opinion on the need to lap vertical rings? Thank you for your time. Well, vertical split rings never get lapped. Vertical rings rely on the actual ring material deforming around the scope tube to hold it in place. Yet, you know, this does put uneven pressure on the tubes, which can distort or damage scopes with really thin tube walls on them. You know, as scopes become larger, and less durable in my opinion. Hunters are starting to move away from the uh, vertically split rings and going back to the horizontal rings. And this actually includes myself. Yeah, you heard that right. Desert Dog is changing his ways too. And I too no longer recommend vertical split rings for modern lightweight scopes. When scopes had one inch tubes and really thick tube walls on them, Vertical rings were great in my opinion, but now that companies want to make bigger 30 millimeter tubes with really thin tube walls, getting good horizontal rings and lapping them is the best way to go in my opinion. And our next letter is from Jonathan in Arizona. Jonathan wrote, I've hunted a lot of North American big game and nearly all the European big game, but have never hunted Africa. Your videos have really inspired me to give it a try. I put together two rifles that I'm calling my Safari Brace. I'm now in the ammo development stage. I've developed, I've decided on the 200 grain partition for my Model 70 and 300 win. I'd like to go with a 300 grain Swift A-frame for my dangerous game Model 70 and 375 H&H, &H, but I can't find them anywhere. I'm an avid reloader and reload all of my hunting ammunition these days. I can locate Nosler partitions in 375 and 300 grains, as well as Nosler solids in 375 and 300 grains. Is a partition a good enough bullet for buffalo? I assume before the A-frame came along, the partition was the king of dangerous game in Africa. Anyway, I appreciate your content and style of delivery and dedication to ethical hunting and safety. Well, thank you very much for the letter, Jonathan, and, and the kind compliments. To answer your question, the uh, 200 grain partition and 300 wind mag is an absolutely perfect and devastating combination for Plains Game in Africa. It's a great choice there. But the partition isn't a highly regarded dangerous game bullet, and it really never has been. You know, you might need to make a, a frontal shot or a quartering shot on your buffalo, which in the really thick stuff is more common than a broadside shot. And if you have to make a shot like that, the partition is just a horrible choice for that. Bullets like the A-frame, the TSX, the Trophy Bonded Bear Claw, and, you know, the Norma Oryx are highly regarded as buffalo bullets. So that's where you should be looking. This month is the beginning of... Uh, the Africa hunting season, especially for the folks hunting the free range countries north of South Africa. You usually can't buy dangerous game bullets at the last minute. You know, I monitor the Swift site every month and stock up on Safari uh, reloading components, you know, whenever they come back in stock. And that's how you kind of have to uh, approach loading that type of ammo. Um, I talked to the owner of Swift Bullets, and 
even indicated on those dangerous game bullets, uh, 375 and above, that they usually only make yearly runs on those. So they put that inventory out for sale, and when it's gone, it's gone until they run it again the following year. But as a favor to you, I sent you links to 300 grain TSXs, trophy bonded bear claws, and Norma Oryx bullets. So uh, hopefully you acted, and if you acted quickly on the links that I sent you, um, after I did my two minute Google search on the subject, you'll get the bullets that you need before your hunt takes place. And our next letter is from Steve in Connecticut. Steve wrote, I wanted to copy Phil Shoemaker's 20 inch barreled 458 wind mag. I purchased a $300 Inner Arms Mark X 458 rifle. The reason being, I did not want to take a, a cutoff saw to the barrel of a Winchester Model 70 or a CZ 550. The bolt has a lot of drag to it. It's not smooth at all. It's an inconsistent pull and I'm curious to any recommendations you would have on how to slick this rifle up. Well, I hate to break this to you, but those old uh, Inner Arms Mark X Mausers have always had receivers that were made of really soft material. You know, with, uh, with questionable or no uh, heat treatment on them. And if you get a really old model chambered in 458 Win Mag, I'd imagine that that gun probably has a lot of bolt lug set, set back on it. So, you know, you'd have to remove the barrel and inspect and measure it. And if it does have bad setback, which is what I suspect with that rifle, it will require machine work and need to be recarburized or some other form of heat treatment before you can use it. And that project is going to cost you a lot more than just buying a Model 70 chambered in 458 Win Mag. I tried to polish the action one time on an Inner Arms Mark X, and this was a long time ago, but basically just the act of running the bolt in that rifle scored grooves in the action. And when I began polishing that action, I noticed how easy it was to remove metal from it. And I immediately stopped and abandoned that project. So, you know, I, I have a saying on my channel that a lot of my viewers know that you don't try to polish a turd. And that saying may or may not uh, apply to your project, Steve. But uh, I'm sorry for my bad prognosis. Our next letter is from Tyler and his daughter Allison from Kent, Washington. Tyler and Allison wrote, Desert Dog, I saw your review of the CZ457 and it looked like some of the beautiful 22 rifles I remember my grandpa having when I was a boy. After seeing that beautiful CZ in your review, I decided to try it out. I trusted your judgment from caliber to scope recommendation. We took it to the range and set a target at 50 yards and was very impressed at the new CZ rifle. I love it. This is the first 22 mag I've ever owned. My oldest daughter got a chance to shoot for the first time and she was shooting a nice grouping. She split holes in the bullseye. This is the first rifle she's shot and she's hooked. Thank you for the post you do with such integrity. Well, thank you for the letter, Tyler and Allison. And I'll say this, nobody has ever bought a CZ457 and regretted it. <laughs> You're just not going to find somebody that has or that good. And the awesome part is that you can quickly convert that rifle to 22 long rifle so your daughter can just shoot all day on the cheap. So thank you for the great letter and congratulations to Allison for her fine markmanship. Our next letter is from John in Arizona. John wrote, I may have missed it from the past, but do you use illuminated reticles on your scopes? Or do you think they're just excess baggage and unnecessary? Well, John, I do prefer illuminated reticles on my hunting rifles, but I don't like really busy illumination. You know, because it obstructs 
uh, dark targets in low light, and I don't like that. I want my illumination in my reticle to be just a small dot or maybe a small cross, and that's it. Most of my kills have been right before sunrise or just after sunset. So, you know, I, I try to buy all of my hunting scopes with some type of illuminated reticle if I can. You know, I wouldn't have been able to see the last sable that I shot if it wasn't for the illuminated reticle on that scope, to tell you the truth. And our next letter is from Damien in Hawaii. Damien wrote, I really like your content and consider you a great guru when it comes to knowledge about outdoor pursuits. I would like your opinion about silencers and muzzle brakes. What do you think is the best to tame recoil on a 300 Weatherby Magnum? I'm going to be 65 years old this year, and I use this same rifle since my late 20s. Besides getting a new rifle, what would you recommend to reduce recoil? Also, what is your opinion about silencers and noise suppression in hunting rifles? I appreciate your wealth of knowledge. Mahalo. Damien, I think sound suppressors are the best thing that you could ever add to a hunting rifle to reduce recoil. You know, and of course, you get the benefit of reduced noise and muzzle blast too. Unfortunately, you live in Hawaii and it's a serious felony for you to own a suppressor. So that's kind of out of the question here, even though that is the best option. And I know how you feel. I live in the People's Republic of California. Um, I absolutely hate muzzle brakes for hunting, Damien. And I just won't hunt with people who use them. And I just won't shoot next to people who use them at the range either. Hunting guides absolutely hate muzzle brakes also. But, you know, they do work. And it's your rifle. So if that's what you want to use, use it. Just know that I personally don't like them. Another option for you is reduce power loads. I don't know if you reload or not. But in that big, huge Weatherby case... There is a problem because it leaves a lot of empty space in there with a reduced power load, and that's going to cause other issues. So with that big Weatherby case, I don't recommend reduced power loads. You know, but I personally think your best option is to sell your Weatherby or maybe give it to your son or grandson and buy a rifle that's better suited for hunting pigs, axis deer, and goat on the Hawaiian Islands. You know, something like a 6.5 Creedmoor or a 7mm 08 shooting a 140 grain bullet is going to be the perfect hunting rifle for Hawaii. And our next letter is from Mark in Northern California. Mark wrote, I just watched your video about hunters dividing into factions and to a certain extent becoming radicalized. It made me think for a time and I came to the conclusion that every culture around the world is currently dividing into factions and radicalizing. What are your thoughts on this? It's a very deep question, and my viewers know I like these. <laughs> and Mark, I think you possess advanced powers of observation and contemplation, and that's a good thing. Um, as I've stated numerous times, people are becoming intellectually lazy and hyper-emotional, not just in America, but everywhere. Intellectually lazy and hyper-emotional people are easily radicalized by politics, the media, religion, and corporate influences. You know, usually you only have to convince them that they're the victim of something and they're puppets from that point on. Being in the business that I'm in right now, I have several employees that were born in India, and some are Sikhs and some are Hindu. And for the last 25 years, these employees just got along great, but now they won't talk or sit together at lunch anymore, which is really odd. But I actually asked them about it, and I listened to their grievances on both sides. And honestly, the my Hindu employees are more radicalized than I've probably ever seen them in my life. You know, they seem to be okay with uh, Modi's murder plots against Sikh leaders, and they really love Vladimir Putin, which is really odd to me, you know, and 
I've also noticed more anti-American sentiment from them. You know, uh, so maybe even the peaceful people of India are lost at this point. And her next letter is from John in Australia. Man, there's just, it seems like there's a lot of Johns this month. <laughs> John wrote, It has recently been announced that the South African government is phasing out the captive bread lion industry. There has long been a significant amount of controversy around this practice. I personally believe that the practice is unethical and damages the image of hunters in the public eye. What are your thoughts on captive bread lion shooting and the South African government's decision to phase it out? Well, John, I think the captive bread canned hunting for lions are a horrible look for the hunting community, but that's, that really is my heart talking. My logical mind says that most of the big sable trophies hanging on hunters' walls right now were also captive bred animals. <laughs> you know, the biggest kudu trophies I've ever seen were from captive bred animals in South Africa. You know, and uh, I've heard of ranchers in South Africa releasing, you know, buffalo, Cape buffalo, well over 40 inches from pastures for rich people to shoot. So... <laughs> and what about the bow hunters that travel to Africa and shoot fenced in animals from a concrete bunker while the animals eat supermarket produce, you know, thrown on the ground in front of them? You know, yeah, if you don't know, that's how they bow hunt in South Africa. So a lot of things go on in South Africa that people get upset about. But the canned lion hunting is probably the biggest issue. And everybody knows that. But being intellectually honest, you have to consider that these canned hunts or the, raise, the raising of captive bred animals might be beneficial in a way to the wild populations. It is something to think about. And our next letter is from Thomas in Belgium. Thomas wrote, I follow some YouTube channels from American hunters and yours is my all time favorite. I noticed Americans are often extremely obsessed with BCs, long distances, recoil, and frankly, unnecessary micromanaging, except for you. And that's why I like you the most. Well, thank you. Europeans in conversations with use a decent minimum caliber and a strong bullet. That's it. Ask us about BCs and we go, huh? Come again? And as to optimizing downsizing calibers, we find it taboo to sacrifice the insurance of a decent killing caliber like the 30 6 Recoil is part of the passion, and one can learn to manage it. Long action versus short action is also a thing only heard from Americans. Here, we don't care. Sometimes we ask ourselves why American hunters are so crazy about extreme details. Why is that? Well, the answer to your question is actually twofold here, um, the, maybe even threefold. You know, number one, Americans are very susceptible to advertising. <laughs> you know, most of the major hunting celebrities around the world are Americans that help sell products. And, you know, some of this is a product of that. But uh, when you get to the long range aspect of it, there's two reasons for it. And the first reason was covered in my long range hunting video, but I'll rehash it a little bit here. During the war on terror, the hunting industry tried to turn hunters into snipers. And that marketing worked really well, except for the fact that hunters didn't turn out to be really good snipers. Secondly, for the exception of maybe Northern Scandinavia, most Europeans don't see animals until they're relatively close to them. So that's where the hunting takes place. Your hunting areas are usually small tracts of private property or maybe forested, heavily forested terrain. But where I live, I can drive 35 minutes from my home, hike up a hill, set up my spotting scope, and I might see deer, pigs, pronghorn, elk or coyotes in the distance. And all of that's on public land too. In the past, we would spot these animals and plant a stock to get close to them, you know, or kind of uh, move to set up an ambush point 
based off of the direction that the animal's traveling. But people just don't do that anymore. And now, rather than putting in the effort to plant a stock or to predict an ambush point, people shoot animals from where they spot them. And this is pure laziness, in my opinion. And people compensate for that by pumping up their ego about making these really long shots. But people are getting, like I said before, people are getting intellectually and physically lazy. You know, if 500 meter public land shot opportunities were common in Europe, trust me, I think Europeans would be doing the same exact thing. You'll find that some people act surprisingly similar in identical circumstances when they're presented. And uh, I think what we're seeing right now is, you know, ethics and morality are going down around the whole world. But uh, there's just less opportunities for it in Europe because your shot opportunities are so close. So that's what I think the reasoning is behind that. And our next letter is from Justin in Pittsburgh. And congratulations, Justin. Your team had an excellent draft. Good draft choices. Congratulations on that. But uh, Justin wrote, I follow published load data from the companies that make the bullets. I have a few bullets, however, with very little load data published, such as Norma bullets. I've been told to just use the Hodgson Reload Data Center to find safe loads. It does show data for that weight bullet, but it is a different bullet brand than what I am loading for. Is it safe to use this information with bullet weight only? even if it is a different style bullet. Well, it is very common to cross-reference load data for bullet weights with different bullets. I do it all the time. But consider this warning. Bullets of the same weight can have drastically different bullet profiles, shapes, and bearing surface area. And this has a big impact on velocity, uh, cartridge overall length, and case capacity, which can increase pressure for any charge weight. So always start at the low end and slowly work your way up when you're cross-referencing reloading data for bullets. And our next letter is from Chase in Houston, Texas. Chase wrote, I need your recommendation for a handgun for bear defense here in Texas. Well, you know, as far as I know, Chase, there's very, very few bears in Texas, and most of those are in the southwest corner of Texas, probably in Big Bend National Park. Um, it's also illegal to shoot a bear in Texas unless your life is threatened, because uh, y'all made them extinct in the 1950s, so they're currently trying to make a comeback. The bears are trying to make a comeback, and you should really support that, in my opinion. If you want to carry a handgun while hunting or fishing in Texas, do it. I mean, I carry handguns all the time while I'm hunting or fishing. I have no problem with that. But carry a cartridge meant for shooting people because your chances of running across a meth lab, an illegal pot farm, or a crazy person are much greater than an encounter with an aggressive black bear. So, you know what? I don't even think there's been a bear attack in Texas in over 70 years. So, you know, I, I think you're really overthinking this subject. And our next letter is from Timothy in Savannah, Georgia. Timothy wrote, Do you spend any time in grizzly country? If so, what caliber do you recommend for a grizzly bear? Timothy, this is literally the last grizzly bear related question I'm ever gonna answer on Hunt Camp Mail. <laughs> you know, I spend time every year in grizzly country, in Alaska with family, uh, in Montana with family, in Idaho with family, in Wyoming. But to tell you the truth, most of that is spent fly. I usually carry bear spray. And uh, I've never had a problem with a bear, and I've seen a lot of them. Ron Spomer, just did an interview on his YouTube channel with Phil Shoemaker. And from now on, I'm going to send everyone who asks about grizzly bears a link to that video that Ron Spomer did. 
Phil Shoemaker has been around brown bears probably more than any human alive, maybe even any human that's ever been out there. You know, always seek advice from an expert on any subject, and no YouTube influencer is an expert on grizzly bear hunting. Trust me on that. But Phil Shoemaker is the top expert on the subject, and his advice is free and easy to obtain. So go watch Ron Spomer's interview with Phil Shoemaker, and that'll answer anything you need to know. And our last question is from Christian from Idaho. Christian wrote, have you seen the movie Mending the Line on Netflix? I absolutely hate movies these days, but that was the best movie I've seen in many years. I watched your recent California to Montana fly fishing video the day after I watched Mending the Line, and I think I get why you do it. I need a hobby that takes my mind off of things and puts me in the moment. I also need something to do when it's not hunting season. I enrolled in a local fly casting class with my son, I think this is a journey we should take together. Thanks for doing what you do. It's a great letter, Christian, and thank you for sending it to me. Um, I did watch that movie, and I loved it. The only one in that movie that had any real fly fishing experience was the woman who played Lucy, you know, the younger woman. But the, the cast of that movie obviously rece received some great instruction and, and pulled it off. Taking this journey into fly fishing with your son is literally pro the best thing you'll ever do for your relationship. In fact, the last day I got to spend with my oldest son while he was still alive was throwing flies on the Madison River. So that movie really connected with me on another level. If uh, you're trying to fix a relationship, trying to heal wounds or trying to mend a broken heart, Fly fishing is just the remedy for everything. It's also a never-ending journey, so you'll probably never lose interest or get bored in it. And once you start catching fish on a fly rod, no other method will ever give you the same sense of satisfaction. Well, that uh, wraps up April's Hunt Camp Mail. Here's some memes for this month. <laughs>
lot of you sent me letters this month wanting my opinion on the wolf incident in Wyoming where the hunter ran over a wolf in a snowmobile, taped the wolf's mouth shut, and paraded it around inside of a bar while he drank and then took it out back and killed it. If you go to my channel and watch my video titled Hunting Ethics, what that guy did is nothing new. And I expressed my opinion about people like that in that video. I also want to thank Daryl for graciously inviting me to hunt pigs on his property here in California. That's very kind and generous of you. I have some great content planned for the month of May, so be sure to subscribe to my channel and enable notifications for my videos. You can reach me with any questions or comments at DesertDogOutdoors at gmail.com. Thank you for watching, and as always, good hunting.